So today we need to finish uh, our part about prototypes and we last time missed the Wizard of Oz technique. So do you know Wizard of Oz? The movie, the book? Yeah. Um, so without spoiling the movie or the book to other people, what is your idea of this technique? What this technique can do? That is taking the name from the movie slash book. We don't have shoes here in this technique. We don't have um, lions without courage or something like that, but uh, was, was, who, was the, who was the Wizard of Oz in the movie or the or, or book? Who, who have seen the film or the movie or the book or read the book clearly? No? <laughs> Did you know the Wizard of Oz? Yes. Anybody ever seen the movie? No. So how, how many of you have actually seen the movie or read the book? Okay, so the Wizard of, of Oz is one person. Great. <laughs> Go. Who is the Wizard of Oz? It's actually the name of the, of the entire movie. <laughs> so it's not a not important character. No, in the movie or in the, in the book? Then we can came to relate it to this. The Wizard of Oz in the film slash, in the movie slash book, is a person that faked a lot of things and fake to be a wizard, because it was actually a wizard. So in the movie and, in, again, in the story, uh, the story is in uh, another world, a fantasy world, where there are witches, where there is magical power, and so it, it makes sense to have a wizard, but in this case, the wizard is just a wizard like in our world, so without real magical power, and there it fake. Everything that he was able to do was actually fake. It was a man behind a machine doing wonderful things, let's say, in the movie. Then I don't want to spoil the story. But the Wizard of Oz technique takes the same idea. We don't always have or know how to complete an application. So we maybe are not able, not we, just us in this room, just people are not yet able to implement something because it's not yet possible in the timeline that we have or in times or the execution needs hours to, to work. Instead, we need response times that are shorter. So this technique is a technique that allows us to test an application that looks like a complete application, but except it is not. So it's a dumb prototype. So this is a picture from the, the movie in which this was the magical, in the movie of the probably 70, 80, 50, 50, so not um, a few years ago, let's say. So this is, you know, uh, there was fire, there was special effects, there was this big head here in the room, uh, etc. and people was surprised to see that, and in the end it was discovered it was actually a man, not in the end, after 10 minutes probably, it was discovered it was actually a man 
a normal man using this complex machinery to make all these things. So all of that was fake. It was a person pushing button, moving levers, giving the idea that everything is more powerful and more complex than what actually was. So this is another example. Do you know what is this? Do you know what is the mechanical Turk? CCC means. <laughs> this is a system for playing chess, the game. And this is a mechanical man. It's not a real man. And it was sold as a very complex machine to play the game with a human opponent, and this machine uh, won a lot of matches with a, a human player. Mm? Uh, except that also in this case, there was a, a space behind the machine where a man, a person, was there and see what, what the other chess player did and move the pieces for the game accordingly. So apparently it was a machine, but in reality it was a human player playing the game with another human player. So this is, again, something like the Wizard of Oz in the movie, but this was in actual real life. So this is something that exists and was also used for a quite a while, quite time as a machine was sold as a machine. No, this is actually a machine that allow you to play chess with another, per with a person, but it was a machine and the machine is able to win the game. So it was sold, not monetary sold, but sold the idea of this machine, but actually it was a man, a person in this machine able to play the game. So also in this case, it was a man that was faking, a person that was faking a user interface, in this case, a complex activity that is playing and winning a chess game. Now we have software that play and wins. But back then, we didn't. They didn't. And so this was the first attempt, but with a person in. So that technique takes the name from the, the book, The Wizard of Oz. And it's a software simulation. It's a user interface that appear working perfectly, but with a human behind. With a human behind that simulate the machine behavior. And this simulated behavior is often, not always, but it's often hidden. So the participant, the person testing the application, the system, typically does not know that it's fake, thinks that it is an actual piece of technology that can work in that way. And this kind of technique is often used to simulate future technology, not just to replace things that we can do easily, but just to simulate how people will behave with future technology like with 100% accurate speech recognition that we don't have right now. Like with conversation, perfect conversation between a man, a person, and a machine that, again, we don't have. Or learning, a machine that learns what you say so that you can follow up after three hours and remembers what you've said, et cetera, et cetera. Again, all things that we cannot do now 100% uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. So it's typically done to simulate future technology that are, uh, either aren't possible or are slow. Mm -hmm. So if for something, if you need something that worked three hours before giving you an answer, is not acceptable from a user interface perspective. You, you cannot wait three hours for get an answer from a user interface. You want an answer quicker than, that, than three hours. And a person can give you this answer quicker. So it's to test future technology, 
and again, the wizard is typically hidden, can also be visible, surely is make visible at the end of the experiment. So the person go there, try the, the Wizard of Oz system, and at the end, discovers that it was actually a man or a woman behind the curtain, so behind everything. So it was not actually a piece of technology, but was a person. And again, the Wizard of Oz is something that we can span on different kind of prototypes. Could be the low fidelity prototypes that have some part of Wizard of Oz. Difficult to take, to make the wizard invisible in that case because it's probably a paper prototype. Uh, and more frequently on a medium high fidelity prototype where you already have some software system so it's easier to show, to hide a person and make some connection. Mm. So how a Wizard of Oz f works, works that you have an interface and when you click something on the interface is either a normal process, software process, that give you a result or is something that the Wizard of Oz, the person, see and type the answer or instruct the interface to do something mm, immediately. So as soon as you say, uh, if, as soon as you see for instance, a sentence that this person is typing in, let's imagine natural language processing, the person see the sentence and know how to answer, and immediately answer. And so it's not a software that do this, but this, but it's a person that, that do this. Um, how to implement a Wizard of Oz prototype? Well, as always, you need to choose which are the tasks and which, is the, which are the scenario that you want to support. Clearly a person can do whatever wants, but to be a little bit more realistic, you need to have some task, specific task and scenario. Then you can create the user interface. Let's imagine a graphical user interface or a vocal user interface, but something that the person can use. And then at the back end, the back office interface, the wizard has a back office interface that to reflect what happens in the participant interface, and so this person can reply to whatever action the person does. And the wizard typically has some rules of behavior, because clearly the wizard is al almost always able to reply correctly to any action. Uh, so it has some rules for when they should reply and how they should reply to fake to keep everything fake, but more realistic as possible. Hmm? So, like, you know that an algorithm can work more or less in that way, so the answer from the wizard are more or less similar to what a real hypothetical computer system can do. Hmm? And again, this is made mostly for testing future technology or technology that are not re ready yet, but it can also be used for clearly testing technology that we know, just we don't have time to implement. And in that case, we know how they work, what to expect from there. So, as a technique has various benefits because it's faster and cheaper than doing any other kind of interactive prototype because a person is able to do most of the thing, if it's not all. Uh, it's typically more real than paper prototype or a medium fidelity prototype with low effort. To create it, to create that. Uh, you can also easily change task and create variation because again, the person is able to handle multiple variation much more than you can insert in a program in the same time, um, etc. And also can allow you to understand which are the application or the part of the application that are more difficult to build. Um, and also who the person who does the wizard sometimes allow a better understanding of the algorithmic requirements. For instance, in terms of time of responses. If I ask you who is the main character of the Wizard of Oz movie, some of you will open Google and look for it and this will delay the answer if you don't know that. If it's a software, it's immediate. So also this can impact al um, algorithmic requirements and give you some additional requirements from where you have to implement 
the actual system, not the prototype, but the actual system. Uh, there are also some cons of the Wizard of Oz. The most important, the most critical is that the wizard may be over optimistic with respect to actual technology. So speech recognition always work. If, you, if a person speak to you or write to you, you basically have a higher success rate of giving the right, the right answer than any computer system at the moment. So there is the risk to be more optimistic or super intelligent like a, a person in that case. And so give false um, perspective on how a piece of technology, to the participant, how a piece of technology can work. So the participant can be more optimistic than needed about the technology and say, oh yes, I need this speech recognition thing because it assumes that the speech recognition things work as a person and we know that is not the case or we will discover this is not the case. Uh, the other risk is that the wizard behavior is difficult uh, because it, it has to emulate appropriately system response within acceptable time and also take into account to avoid to be over optimistic the system limitations. It's not always easy to, to do all this thing. And well, clearly it's at least two researcher, one that is doing the wizard and the other one that is doing, that is handling the test in general. Okay. So this is just to wrap up the, what we have said up to now about prototypes. And so we started from storyboard to describe user scenario, prototype plus storyboard. And we started from storyboard to understand the user scenario and the user task that we know how to decompose if needed. Then as soon as you move, you can have informal user involvement, you can have critiques more or less structured, and you can also have control experiment usability testing in various phases of this process. And as a reminder, any kind of prototypes, including the storyboard, will give you different information on a piece of technology and will allow you to move quickly to the next step before realizing then the final products that can be evaluated, that can give you other kind of feedback, but is not the kind of feedback that you get with a prototype. And this close the prototypes things. Any question? No? Okay. So, next topic. So we, we, have start, we have seen prototypes. You have started to create some storyboards, some paper prototypes, and in the course we will uh, ask you to create also a medium fidelity prototype and evaluate it, and a high fidelity prototype and evaluate it. So all of these except the evaluation was what we have discussed up to now. But to do the evaluation and also to create these prototypes, also to create the, the paper prototype, we need to understand which are the best practices, which are the things that we want to consider to create this piece of uh, technology or this, this interface, this graphical interface in our case. That is the topic that we are going to start today and then we also have other lectures about guidelines, et cetera, in the coming weeks. Uh, to give you the tools for design user interfaces that doesn't have the basic errors that are easy to, to understand. And we are going to speak now about um, theory, principle, and guidelines of design. That seems some, some sort of the same thing, but they are not. The theory is a thing that is different from principle and is different from guidelines. But before the game, so all of fame or all of shame? Quickly to fame. 
shame. Okay, who say fame? Why? Because it, com because it conveys the same information the same way, in different way, and it's effective. And it's also a good, a good piece of user interface for colors and not a lot of text, et cetera. I agree. Why shame? Because there are too many options. Well, this is a scale between zero and 10. So yes, there are 10 options. But it's not really a problem, that one. Okay, that is, that could be one thing to, to improve. Now we know that 10 is extremely likely and zero is extremely unlikely and we don't know exactly well uh, which is the difference between nine and 10 or between zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, because yes, it's 10 extremely likely but the real problem is another one. This could be something to improve. And if it was just for this, it could be easily a Hall of Fame. Because yes, it's an improvement, not the, the top 10, but in the Hall of Fame, but still. There is another bigger problem here. Yeah, the, 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 these faces here and the colors, tells you, this is a leading question in a way, tells you which are the options that you are suggested to select if you look at the faces. Which are the numbers that, that the faces tell you it's better to select? Nine and 10 out of 10. So basically eight is bad, nine is good. This is leading. So uh, how likely you recommend, so if you say six uh, is bad, six should be bad out of 10. It's reasonable, I mean, if it's not really good. So I'm not smiling until nine. So this is leading because I'm trying to say, if you want to have a positive score, nine and 10 are the options. The other ones are not really fully positive answer because of the faces and the colors. They clearly do this intentionally. And not eight? Why? So why having a scheme between zero and 10? We can have a zero, one, two, three. One, two, three, just. That's not, uh, that's an excuse for, for them, if you want. But you, you know, you can also put some sentences to explain or have less between zero and 10, just have between zero and five. So this is a leading question. The same leading question that you have in the interviews, because you are saying nine and 10 are the positive answer. And so you are, some way giving the impression that the only valid positive answer are nine and 10. And so you are forcing the people to answer nine and 10 because they are associated with a positive meaning. So either you can have less options or you should have, I don't know, uh, the first four red and then the other three and four orange and then the, the last four green to have a more balanced distribution of colors. It is when it's similar to what happens, I don't know if it never happens to you, but when sometimes you receive, oh, you get shopping to this supermarket, and can you give us a store, a, a, a score? And you select eight, and then you receive an email that say, oh, no. If it, everything was good, you have to select nine and 10, not eight. Okay, so why are you asking me? Just tell me bad and good. Since I then you complain if I select eight and not nine. So basically eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero is bad. And nine and 10 is good. So why are you putting all these options? It's just good or not. If you interpret the information this way. 
So this is really leading as a question. And, and then if you select eight, you maybe receive an email that say, oh, you should have selected nine because we are penalized if you select eight is, is a model that is not working. We, we will see a little bit. We will have a, a lecture about design patterns. And this is a sort of what was called a dark pattern and now it's called a deceptive pattern, meaning that try to convince the person to do one thing and not the other. In this case, it's a leading question. So it's a little bit more shame, but not for the graphical aspects. That is good, actually, because the color, etc., but for the content in this case. OK. Now, back to the design principle theories and guidelines. So where we are now, what we have covered now and what we will cover in the future. So we spoke about need finding and requirements and task. So this pillar here. So this picture, say, I don't know if we, if we met, it, her, met it before, but this picture say, to do a successful user interface, in general, you should have these four pillars. And the first pillar is about the requirements and the finding. The second pillar is about theories and models, in particular guidelines, documents, principles, processes. The third pillar is about algorithms, prototype, and software tools, so a graphical user interface a software user interface, and the fourth pillar is about evaluation. And we covered three, two of these pillars already. We covered the need finding phase here, how to structure requirements, how to build tasks, etc. We spoke about the prototypes. We are not speaking about, we won't speak about algorithms. It's because we, we don't, focus too much on how you be, you're going to build the final prototype, but clearly it has an impact on the choice of the algorithm that you're going to use on, again, response time. And specific tools also. If you're going to do a mobile application, you have some kind of tools to be used, not others. And what we're going to, to start speaking today is this pillar about theories and models and guidelines. That is, in a way, connected not, also, not only with the design of a user interface, but also with the evaluation, the review, the expert review of a user interface. So we're going to see, again, theories, principles, and guidelines that will help us and guide us to create user interface and later on also as a good starting point for evaluating this user interface, mostly for the expert review, that is the heuristic evaluation that we are going to see. So the goal of these principle theories and guidelines is for sure generating design solution. That is something that, again, you start to do now with paper prototypes, but it's also helpful, especially for evaluating and especially in the expert review and heuristics. So directly from that and indirectly, we can say also for the other two items here, usability testing and control experiment. Because if you don't follow, let's say this guideline, if you don't follow the theory, the principle, don't apply these things in your design, you will already know that something here is going to fail. So it's sort of pre-requirement to build things that doesn't have basic mistakes, basic error in it. Because there are, these are theories, these are models that we know they work for how people work. And so if, they are, if we are able to apply them well, we prevent ourselves to do errors. So as I told you, we have three different things, theory, principle, and guidelines. We will focus mostly on principles, but we will mention also the other two. So they are three different things. 
so let, let's see this, this graph here that is more a practical and operational graph. So theories are the abstract things. High-level frameworks that tell you how, to, how people work. So you remember the normal model from the first week? That is a theory. Not the only theory that exists, but is a theory of design. It doesn't tell you wh how, what to do. It tells you that there is some gaps, hmm? that there are some action that we do. It describes how we do things. Hmm? It does not really help us in applying things concretely. It just tells you, oh, we have the goal for execution, and we want to minimize that. And then we need to find a way to minimize that. Hmm? So it describes how to do things, basically, in a higher level. So they are abstract. Then moving, on the other side, we have the very practical, a concrete formulation of how things are done. That are the guidelines. The guidelines are low-level advice about good practice, about things to avoid, about dangers, to avoid in user interfaces. And the guidelines often are also adapted to different kind of applications. So the guidelines for the desktop will be different from the guidelines for the web, that will be different from the guidelines for mobile, that will be different from the guidelines from, for AI, that will be different from the guidelines from VR and AR. Because they are specific, low level, very, very specific, very, very concrete. So it needs to bind to the actual thing hmm, that you have to create. And in the middle, we have principles. Principles are, again, midway between theories and guidelines. So they are not so, la so low level, like guidelines, but not even abstract as theories, and are strategies, rules, more applicable than theories, and more general than guidelines to analyze, to compare alternatives, to evaluate things according to. Mm -hmm. And so this is about abstraction and vice versa if we speak about domain on which these things are applicable, clearly theory being the more abstract are the more applicable. They can be applied to everything. Guidelines, as I said before, are really, really specific to some particular cases. So the guidelines for VR cannot be applied as is to interacting with artificial intelligence or digital well-being, just to mention three random things. They cannot, because they are specific for that domain. So maybe some ideas are common, but they are different things. So we will have guidelines more specific for one thing and for the other. Principle, again, are midway, hmm? able to generalize a little bit. So design theories, we already have spoken a bit about design theories. We will speak about what I temporarily call the human abilities, I think, next week. Um, that, is, that will be connected to this. But typically, we have four kinds of, of theories that are this one report in the slides, so descriptive, explanatory, prescriptive, and predictive. So theories that try to tell things under different, tell more or less the same story, but after, I, under different lenses. So there are things more descriptive, trying to theorize about terminology, semantics, etc., and things that are more prescriptive, so helpful for making decisions in one direction or the other. And theories are often linked to human abilities. So it could be motor task, it could be perceptual, or it could be cognitive. So motor task means skills in pointing, clicking, being precise enough to do an action, be quick enough to do an action, etc., And this is not something that we can, can change a lot. We can learn, we can improve as human beings, but if we cannot do one action quick enough, 
At a certain point, we cannot do an action quick enough. Hmm? And similarly, most importantly, also perceptual. Hmm? So perceptual means all the inputs and outputs that we have that are, which are our inputs. as human beings, which are our inputs. Our senses describe the senses. Which are our senses? Eyes, okay, um, sight, um, hearing, mouth, T taste is the sense, mouth is the object, Taste is the sense. Then, smell. Nose, it's the object, but again, smell and. No, we said four of them. Touch, let's say touch. Um, so, what we, we perceive on our, uh, on our body in general. And these are the inputs, which are the outputs. The same objects, but some of them work as output also. The voice, the gesture, let's, yes, could be outputs. The reaction that we have also could be when you, we, we touch something extremely hot, we move as a reaction, uh, or we scream, it depends, but voice again. Anybody, anything else? No. And how many, uh, how, we already have this, we already had this question, but uh, which is the most, I think, which is the most used input modality that we use? Sight. The second one? Hearing. Do we use other, we use gestures? We use gesture as an output to interact with the computer, but more as an, our output as an input of the computer. Do we use the other senses with the computer? Yes, voice, speech, but smell, not yet. And um, um, hearing, taste. I don't think that you put something in your mouth to interact with the computer. Okay, so we, we have much more senses and more, much more input and output opportunities that we don't use currently. Again, our user interface are mostly visual. Also, hearing. Do you use a lot of hearing for a graphic user interface? Not a lot. A bit. A bit when you empty the trash on the routing system, there is a sound. And so you can be distracted and you can, if you don't move to the computer, you can also uh, listen to, to that. Or when you receive a notification, that is another cue. And then there is the cognitive part. So our capability to do problem solving and now our memory, the capability to Memorize thing, not, not particularly long term with a computer system, a bit, depends what you're going to do, but especially in the short term. So if you imagine a form, a multi-step form, that is using our short memory to remember what we did in the previous step. So if we didn't have short memory, we could not remember the previous step. And if we have an extremely powerful short memory, we can probably remember the 10 previous steps. And so the design of user interface will change according to that. But we, we don't. We, rec we remember a few things only. And so our user interface are binded to our capability. The user interface that we are using now are binding to that capabilities. Okay, just to, to make a few examples of theories, uh, we have seen that. You will surely remember that. This is an explanatory model. 
So it explains how we and a system, a computer, work together from a theoretical point of view, from an abstract point of view. We know that we can maybe change something in the performance, in the presentation, we can reduce the goal for evaluation of the execution, but it doesn't tell us how to do any of this. It just explains that when something happens, we know why this happens. So if I want to open this door, what I need to do? Push, and how do you know that I have to push? How do we know that I have to push, we have to push this door? It's right, I have to push if I don't, not, not the door, because it, otherwise it doesn't open, I have to push the handle. Why? Common usage. And <laughs> Come, the standards common usage. Yes, because we, well, first of all, we are used to this. So we know that this is something that we need to push. And there is not a, actually other, other way to, if, I, if, I, if we pull, it doesn't happen anything. But you don't go here and pull. You push. You don't try to pull. And vice versa, how many times you try to push a door that needs to be pulled, or vice versa. Not with this kind of doors. So this is, these are the goal for execution in practice, basically. When it's working, the goal for execution is minimal, and the goal for evaluation is minimal, because we are, by the design of the handle, that is also commonly used, but by the design on the end, there is no other option. We, we, if, if we pull this, nothing happens. And, but we don't want to, we, we are instinctively push this for how the thing is designed. When we have a door and we push instead of pulling or vice versa, that is where the goal for execution and evaluation are very, very large. So this explains what happens doesn't tell us how to improve the design, clearly. Hmm? But that is a classical example of the goals in practice. The door, and it's not our problem that we push a door that should be pulled, it's the door that is badly designed. Hmm? This, in this way, is good design because we know what to do. Instinctively, we don't have to think about it. Hmm? And this, this is also good design for another reason. Uh, how can I open this door by pushing? Yes, but how? Tell me two ways in which I can open this door. With the hand is one way. Or with the body is another hand. Another way. Yes. This is also a sign of good design. So you're enable, if you have your... Um, harm broken, you can open it. Because everything, also with, with your foot probably you can open it, but maybe not. But it, this is good design to, in general, in the physical world. And then we can have the same good design in the digital world. We should have the same good design in the digital world. And again, theory explain all of this. This theory explain all of this. Um, this other Foley and Van Damme forever approach is instead descriptive. It doesn't, play, doesn't say how, we, how, why we do things. So the goal of explanation, etc. It just describe things. Describe that we have a conceptual level that is our mental model of the system, a semantic level, a syntactic level, and a lexical level. It describe how things work. So our mental model of this door, again, is that there is an handle that we, we need to push. And this is the mental model. If we find another door identical to this, with the same handle, but we need, where we need to pull, we're going to push. Because our mental models say push. And that's why we, we pull things instead of pushing. But again, is our mental model is formed because we are used to that, and it's, and it's formed because that handle tells push. Don't pull. 
and this is the conceptual level. Don't describe how, just say that this, there is a mental model that the other theory put in practice with the goal for execution, etc. And again, all this level from the, the higher to the lower, so the lexical level is device dependencies, mechanism, etc. Then there are consistency theories that are prescriptive. If you remember, prescriptives are guidelines to make decision. So in the consistency theory, we know, this is again a theory that can be applied to everything from digital to, no, to not digital, that if we have a consistency between nouns and verb, we reduce learning time and errors. But consistency could be also color, layout, icon, font, button size, size of the handles, color of the doors, etc. We, we're used to consistency. If we see consistency, we see a pattern, and if we see a pattern, we know how to behave. So all these four actions are consistent. Delete a charter, delete a word, delete a line, and delete a paragraph. It doesn't say delete a charter, eliminate a word, remove a line, and I, I don't have any other synonyms for delete in this moment. It's consistent, the same verb used for the same action that is delete. And insert, not insert, add, etc. It's just insert along the entire application, the entire list of things, consistency. It's easier for us to recognize, we go in automatic mode after learning that delete something allow us to delete something. And then we just focus on something that is after the verb. And clearly inconsistency are used for drawing attention. Since we, as again, human beings love consistencies, when we found inconsistency, we immediately noticed that. If we are in a system where everything is consistent except a few things, if we're in a system where everything is inconsistent, one from another, we don't clearly know that one thing is different from another. And later, there is also an example about inconsistency uh, on GitHub. Okay, so these are three examples of theories. Again, we will speak a little bit, bit more about human abilities that is linked to, to this. And our other theories, uh, laws also, there are a few laws in human computer interaction, like the Fitz law, um, that we're going to, to briefly see. Uh, because it's something that we use. We, we don't know, but we use, it's applied every time you use a computer. For instance, the Fitz law. Okay, theory. Very, very general, very, very abstract. Principle. Principles are more practical, as I said, are even fundamental, so they are applicable more than guidelines. Uh, we have typically, we have a, a various principles in human interaction. We are going to see, uh, especially the eight golden rules of interface, interface design. Uh, and principle are mostly focusing on preventing errors and giving the person control on a system. So balancing automation versus control. Because in some cases it's desirable, in other cases not. Automation. Control is always desirable. So before speaking about uh, principle, let's have just a overview of which are the main, let's say, five interaction styles. So we have these five interaction styles, generally. The first one is direct manipulation. That is what we typically do always with a computer. When you drag and drop something, it's direct manipulation. Because you directly manipulate an object on the screen. You move an object on the screen. When you select text, idem is direct manipulation. And it has some advantages and disadvantages. It's easy to learn. You know how to drag and drop easily, and you know that that is an action. If you, you know how to select text with a mouse and a 
and that is the same action. You know how to tap on something, you know how to zoom on something. You directly manipulate this object. So is uh, easy to be done, encourage exploration. Think about drag and drops. If you don't drop the object in the right position, so you have something on the desktop, you want to drop it in a folder on the desktop. What happens if you miss the folder? You have a document on the desktop, you want to drag and drop it in a folder that is on the desktop. What happens if you, do, if you miss the folder? So you don't, don't drop in the folder, but just outside? It's moved there, and it's, it's a problem. Some, you lose the document, you, no. Nothing happens. I mean, it's still on the desktop. It's still, it's not an error. It's not that you lose the document or you have to revert the action. You take the, the icon, you take the document and pull it and put it in the folder in a second trial, in a second test. So the first time it didn't work, let's try again. And it, it's, it's not a problem. Clearly we, we waste a little bit of time, but it's something that is easy to be done. It doesn't give us any specific errors or any losses uh, with respect to other actions. And also encourage exploration. So it's, it's easier to, to move things around because we know that not bad things happen. Uh, disadvantages of direct manipulation, well, drag and drop is not, if you think drag and drop, for instance, on the web, is not the easiest thing to implement. It's not the most complex ever, but uh, menu selection is way easier than drag and drop, in which you have to define a drop context that an object is draggable, and then what happens during the drag, and what happens when you drop it, so it's, it's really not the simplest things ever, and clearly required direct manipulation required a screen, and often a mouse. You don't have direct manipulation with voice assistant, because you don't have a screen. You don't manipulate nothing directly. Um, or augmented reality, virtual reality, that is another case in which you directly manipulate things. Uh, the second interaction style is menu selection. Menu, you have a menu, you select something in the menu. Something again that we are used to. And again, pros and cons. Hmm? So it's a structured way. We know which are the options because we see them in the menu. These are all pros. And we can have dialogue. So we click something and then we can have, oh, are you sure that you want to do this? Hmm? Something that in direct manipulation we typically don't have. Um, Vice versa, if you have an application with 100 menus, probably is overwhelming, so too many menus, and frequent users are slowed down by menu selection. So when you need to copy and paste something, what do you do? You have you are in Word or whatever, you want to copy and paste a sentence. What do you do? Select it, and then, how do you copy? Control C, it's not a menu. So if we just have a menu selection to copy, you have to go to copy, go to the edit menu, select copy, and then go somewhere else, go to edit menu, select paste. That is menu selection. Control C, Control V, or whatever alternatives exist, are instead shortcut to avoid using the menu for frequent user. Now, for copy and paste, probably almost everybody is a frequent user, but shortcut exists also for other kind of menu voice less popular for everybody. So this is menu selection. It's another way of interact interacting than direct manipulation. Then there is forms fill in. You have a form, you fill, it a for fill in a form, you press next until the process is ended. That is another way of interacting, different from menu, different from direct manipulation. In some cases, you can do things 
in direct manipulation or choose to do it by menus. In some other cases, it doesn't make sense, but still is an interaction style. Uh, common language. What is common language? It's not a natural language. What is common language? What is a common language interface? The common line, the terminal, the common line, Linux or Windows or whatever, yes, in that case. That is another interaction style. You don't have menus, you don't have forms, you don't have direct manipulation, you don't have natural language. Um, is it flexible as a way of interacting, the common line? Or it's constrained like a menu? Why it's constrained? Yes, you have to know which, which command to type, clearly. And the order of parameters. Order parameters. Uh, but yes, so that is here, required training and memorization, or read a lot of things to, to, have the, the, to find the right command. But it's also flexible, because you can have one million commands, one, 10,000 million commands, if you want. You cannot put all this information in a menu. You cannot get, pay, pick a common language interface and port it in a graphical user interface one-to-one. -one. You cannot. There are too many options in the common line interface to do that. You have to choose. You have to organize hmm, the things from the common line. So it's flexible. It's terrible for memorization. It's terrible for error handling. If you do remove minus rf to a folder and you press enter it's done and the folder is gone so you don't have to you cannot if it was a mistake too late you cannot handle errors very very specifically uh, but it also appeals to power users because if you remember things you want to do things quickly in some cases the common line is quicker than a graphical interface. But for a power user, not for the novice user. And then there is the natural language that is written or vocal, never mind, that is an emerging style, much, much more emerging, that has its own pros and cons. Um, so in theory, here it lists much more cons than pros, but uh, let, let's say vocal, so that keystroke doesn't matter, which, which are some pros and cons of natural language as an interaction style? Yes, that is a product, a device, but yeah, let's imagine Google Home, which has the pros and cons of Google Home versus doing the same thing with a graphical user interface. You are? You are slower to front us, which one? Which, the vocal or the? Vocal. Because you have, um, what is the kind of common they have? Yeah. Okay, so I agree 50%. So yes, you have to remember, again, all of these. You have to remember, that's the main problem, especially vocal, not visual, absolutely not visual user interface, which you have to remember what to say and they don't understand everything. And you have to say, so it's similar to command line, command line in a way. You have to know what to say and which order to say, otherwise maybe it doesn't understand. Sometimes it could be faster than turning on a computer or unblocking computer and go on Google to see the weather forecast. You can say what is the weather forecast. So about speed, it depends. It can also be faster. But yes, about memorization is clearly a, a big problem. Another big problem of vocal user interface? Does they, you can always use a, a vocal user interface when you can, for weather forecasting. Let's say this is an example. Uh, so you want to know which is the weather tomorrow here. You can do it at 1, 1 a.m. It's, it's what happened after that is uh, the interesting part. Uh, yes, there are some contexts in which you cannot really or do this. 
or doesn't work. If you are in a very crowded place, you can type on Google Weather. If you are in a very crowded place, if you try to speak with a device that is on the other side of the room, you will not have an answer because it's too noisy for the voice as input modality. So, but these are the four, the five principal interaction style for which natural language also apply to writing. So written natural language, not just vocal natural language recognition. That it's the same at a certain point because the vocal part is typically translated in text and then analyzed. Also in Google Home and similar. But these are the five interaction styles that we, they are mixed together and we use all of them. Less frequently than natural language. Some people doesn't use the common language at all, but overall these are the five principal interaction style. Uh, and then we, we, we could add, for instance, uh, something about virtual reality and augmented reality. That is another slightly different interaction style, but it's not it's a traditional classical interaction style. So from the action model, from the theory, uh, we have some principle of normal, on Norman, about good design and about when failures can occur. So the principle are, for instance, state and the action alternatives should be visible in a system. So you should see a system and understand which is the state of the system and which are the action that you can do in the system in that moment. To concretize this, the door, which is the state of the door, closed. And it's inequivocally closed. You, it's visible that it's closed. And which are the, the action that we can have on the door now? Open. We can just have one action. It is pull, pushing the bar to open the door. If it's open, we maybe have other actions. We can have the door closed or we can open this other side of the door, for instance. So if this one is open. But now, if we open, we open. Also, if we push here, we open everything. And so the only action that we can do here is open. So say, also in a system, also in a digital system, the alternative the status should be always visible, like in this case of the ZOR. Should be a good conceptual model with a consistent system image. That means we should easily understand what, we, what the system is ready to do for us. So our conceptual model is aligned with the system model. So the two languages between the system and the person are the same, are aligned. Uh, interface should include the good mapping that relieve the, the reveal the relationship between the various parts, between the various steps, etc. Again, visibility. In this case of relationship between the, the information. So something is a child or something else, or something is contained within something else or not, or are not related. And the user should receive continuous feedback. So you should always have a feedback of your action. That could be a very, very notable feedback or a very, very small feedback, but still a feedback. When fa failures can occur. And so these are principles, a little bit more specific than theories. So you can see something and say, okay, which is the state? Which are the actions? It's something more actionable than the theory. And when failures can occur? Failures can occur when the person form an inadequate goal. I go there, I see the door, I want to pull. That is a failure. Not of the person, but of the designer of the door. Uh, another failure will happen when the person not find the current object in a digital interface, could be an icon or a label. So I'm looking for buy something and I don't find buy. And so I press something else. Because in that website, it's called in another way. Or in that application, it's called in another way. So I don't find the object because it's called different in what I'm expecting. This is crucial when you work with specific population, like doctors, nurses, or in an environment where there are specific language and terminology that are not the general ones. 
This happens much more frequently in those cases. Uh, or the failures happens when you don't know how to execute an action. Okay, I understand the door is closed. I know that I can open it. I don't know how. Because it's not immediate to me how. So I, I, know, I know my intention, but I don't know how to perform it. Or when I receive inappropriate or misleading feedback. So I do something and I receive a message, say something, and my reaction is, what? And that is a misleading feedback. Uh, Schneiderman, um, that is one of the author of the books that we mentioned in the first lecture, um, then defined eight that is called golden rules of interface design that we are going to see all of them, but quickly they are strive for consistency. We know from theory that consistency is something that we recognize and doesn't, doesn't have us to think too much when things are consistent. So try to have consistency when possible. Uh, focus on universalizability. Give feedback that is informative. Uh, when you design dialogues, try to conclude the conversation, hide the closure. Prevent errors, not fix error, handle errors after they happen, but just prevent them if possible. Uh, permit easy reversal of action, the undo, hmm? that in many user interfaces is possible. Keep user in control, hmm? so the person should always be or feel to be in control of the situation, and reduce, reduce short-term memory load, not to impose fatigue on the person. So for consistency, what it means? Again, quite general, but quite applicable more than theory. For consistency, what it means? It means that similar situation should lead to similar sequences of actions within a system and also linking to what we know, like for the end of the door. We know that we need to push it. So if, we, if we have to design another handle, we would probably follow the lead. And similarly, if we have something in a user interface that we know how it works, that everybody knows how it works, let's try to be consistent and use that. Again, if it's a standard, officially or not. So within and outside the application, consistency in similar situations should lead to similar sequence of action. Uh, use the same terminology within an application, independently where you are, in the help, in the menu, in the prompts, in the dialogue. If you call something by, that is always should be by. If it's the same thing. Consistency of color, layout, capitalization, fonts, etc. Pick three fonts, pick three layouts. The title should be always capitalized or not. Pick a decision and follow that decision. Consistency. If you have two titles that are capitalized and one title that is not, it's an inconsistency that have people ask why. Why this, this is different from all the others. There is something wrong here or not. And exception, as we said, should be limited for especially, let me see if there is here, no. Um, if there is some particular cases, maybe delete a danger zone because we are going to delete everything. So, so if our user interface is all gray and blue, let's say, maybe the delete everything is red, is in another color, is another font, is another square around it, just to say this is something that they want you to be attentive to. So it's not something that is like the other, it's something that you have to pay attention because you can do a disruptive, a destructive action in this way, and you cannot recover from that, like deleting a GitHub repository, for instance. So that action could be 
could violate the consistency of the, of the user interface. And again, this applies to physical world and to digital world. Okay, we can continue tomorrow with the other seven and some example of this rule. Uh, if you have any question, I'm still here for a few minutes. Otherwise, let's see tomorrow.